my little dog gets so excited in the morning. See that. Green Mountain Powers College Connection is sponsored by College of St. Joseph and Stafford Technical Center. At the College of St. Joseph, what we would like to do is look beyond just getting them into the program, but making them the best in those programs and successful. Part of the concern at a place like CSJ is, oh, it's small, but Instead of looking at it as a problem, we can look at it as it's actually great. We're flexible. We can make changes in our programs very quickly. We don't have to wait years to do that. I like the small size of the classrooms and uh, the small amount of students. Everyone gets individualized attention from the instructor. It's very comfortable and very, just very nice to be in. At Stafford Technical Center, you can explore your possibilities have hands-on learning, pursue your passion, and start your career. Want to see what they're laughing at? Visit StaffordOnline.org, and while you're there, you might as well check out our application page. Welcome to GMP College Connections. We're here at the Energy Innovation Center. Thank you all for coming out on this cold night, and thank you for last month we had about a dozen people watching at home, online, on STCN. So at first I want to thank uh, Stafford Technical Center, STCN, which is their online television network. They are broadcasting live and recording for us. So thank you very much. Um, and let's see, a quick... Uh, promotion for tomorrow morning, if you'd like to tune in to WSYB, 1380 AM. Um, our guest lecturer tonight from Green Mountain College, Dr. Stephen Latenda, will be on morning chat with Ken Hayes, <coughs> talking about a um, bit about what we're talking about tonight, and I'm sure a multitude of other um, topics regarding energy and policy. Uh, so tune in tomorrow at 9 AM. <coughs> Uh, I want to thank very much uh, Dr. Latinda for agreeing to uh, come back again this year uh, for the lecture series. And um, he offered to uh, talk about anything he'd like to, and uh, he offered to talk about um, <coughs> how do we encourage renewable energy in Vermont. And uh, for the conversations going on in the State House, uh, a lot of acronyms being thrown around, um, we will have a great navigation uh, from Dr. Latenda, who is a professor of economics and environmental studies at Green Mountain College. And um, I'm welcome and thank you very much. And All right. Thank you, Jerry. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, appreciate it. So, I'm excited to, to be here to talk to you about renewable energy. This is a topic that I'm quite passionate about. I've been working in this uh, area for uh, about 20 years. As a graduate student uh, at the University of Delaware, this was back in um, the mid-90s, I was a, a research assistant uh, funded through the U.S. Department of Energy, and this was, you know, 15, 18 years ago, uh, we were uh, beginning to model uh, the value of distributed solar on buildings. And so uh, what's happened uh, over those uh, 15, 20 years is really quite remarkable, and uh, Vermont has really been um, a leader in a lot of uh, what's happening in terms of this, this industry. So, um, so the title is, it's kind of a broad overview of kind of where we are in Vermont and where we might be going, but I wanted to begin my talk this evening by kind of uh, the question of why. Why do we want to transition to uh, renewable forms of energy? And to start that off, I just want to uh, do a little uh, video um, introduction to some of the uh, impacts that our energy systems have um, from a website called Energy Reality. Hopefully uh, this is going to work here, guys. Make it big. Ah. Go back 
here. So, so again, the starting point is why, why do you want to transition uh, to renewable forms of energy? And um, this little <coughs> uh, video picture of, uh, of our sources of energy, really, uh, in Vermont, we're isolated from a lot of that. We don't really see uh, what's happening um, upstream from the energy that we consume <coughs> on a, a daily basis. And there are, are major impacts, as, as we can see from, from, that, uh, from that video. But here in Vermont, of course, we're not isolated from some of the effects of our uh, dependence on fossil fuels, uh, in particular the impacts of climate change. Uh, this is a satellite photo of uh, Superstorm um, Irene, or they called Tropical Storm Irene. It wasn't a hurricane, it was a tropical storm. And we all know that that had major uh, cost implications for the state. I think this is uh, Route um, 100 uh, heading up to um, Bethel, uh, major uh, erosion of the roadway. 
Uh, I guess we ended up spending... Well, there have been few more passionate debates in resource economics than around peak oil. Whether it has or hasn't happened, and indeed whether peak oil... How did that happen? Sorry about that. My apologies. My computer is acting up. Okay. <clears throat> Close that so that doesn't happen. And we'll start again. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, the estimates I, I saw that uh, the, that's, that uh, Tropical Storm Irene cost the state almost of a, a half a billion dollars, fi over $500 million, uh, hugely expensive storm. In uh, just uh, around the 4th of July, in um, July 3rd actually, just this past summer, uh, there was a, a, an intense storm, an intense microburst <coughs> in Pulteney and um, East Pulteney that caused uh, significant damage. Um, trees were down. Are you getting feedback from this, or? Okay, sorry. Uh, trees were down, um, and, and the town of Pulteney had to cancel the Fourth of July parade, which was a huge deal uh, for the town of Pulteney. That's one of their their uh, most important events uh, uh, in the year. And there was, you know, thousands of dollars were uh, spent um, cleaning up uh, the downed trees. Green Mountain College had significant damage on our campus. Uh, a number of uh, very old maple trees were down, <coughs> and there's a there's a cost associated with that. And then most recently, um, in I uh, believe it was uh, December 11th, there was a major storm and the conditions were just such that the rain and the snow caused uh, a major um, outages across the state. 90,000 people were out of power. Um, of course, Green Mountain Power did an incredible job uh, getting folks uh, back online, uh, but it was a huge effort. I, as I understand, this was one of, um, one of the most expensive and ex expansive efforts uh, Green Mountain Power's part to, to get people back online. And so there's a real cost associated with that. So again, although we are um, somewhat isolated as a state from kind of the, the extraction, the transportation, and the refining of, of fossil fuels, uh, we are as a state beginning to experience direct impacts as a result of burning fossil fuels, accumulating carbon in this atmosphere, uh, leading to climate change. <clears throat> and this is a comment from the Agency of Natural Resources. We can expect that these intense uh, frequent storm, these inten the intensity of these storms will increase over time, and so we can anticipate that the costs will continue uh, on and perhaps even escalate over time. So, how many people have taken an economics class <coughs> in the audience? Okay, so we have a few economists out there. <coughs> so, um, so what I want to do is I just want to give you a quick economics lesson. So this is a review for some of you. And um, it's this, uh, and, and I want to do this so that we can understand kind of the economic dimensions of, of these impacts that energy have, which may uh, not be reflected in the prices that we pay as consumers. So um, the, the basic model, core model in, in economics is, is an academic discipline, right? You can get a degree in economics. I have a master's degree in economics, textbooks in economics, uh, journals in economics. And it's a social science, and it's a social science that focuses on uh, choice. How individuals and communities of individuals, groups of individuals make choices when confronted with scarcity. We have limited resources and we have unlimited ways that we can use those resources. So a core model in economic theory is this idea that supply and demand or the market mechanism is the best, most efficient way for societies and individuals to, to decide between these competing uses of our limited resources. And so this is really hark, harks back to uh, the famous economist Adam Smith, his invisible hand. There's these forces out there that direct our economy and it's very efficient. And it's really quite amazing. There are billions of products and services that we have uh, at our disposal and the market just seems to determine which ones make it, which ones don't, and we go about our days um, making, making choices. So economic theory also though suggests that there are cases when the market outcomes, the outcomes in markets will not be the best for society. We could reallocate our resources in a different way and we could be collectively better off. And one of the key factors that leads to this, what we call market failure, are externalities. And externalities is a concept in economics. It's the costs 
to um, individuals or groups of individuals that had nothing to do with the original production or consumption of the good or service under, uh, under consideration. So the classic example is pollution. A factory is creating widgets, causes pollution. Um, a child in the city is affected by the poor air quality which results from the pollution, goes to the hospital and gets a bill to be treated for his asthma attack. That is a direct cost to the manufacturing process that's not reflected in the prices that we pay for those goods and services. So in those cases, in the case of market failure, in the case of externalities, markets fail to deliver the best outcome for society. So um, this is, goes back 100 years in economic theory, this idea that if we, don't, if we just let markets, in the case of externalities, to go uncorrected, that we as a society will be harmed. So there's a famous economist uh, by the name of Arthur Pigou, and he is one of the leading economists who really came up with a theory about how do we address this externality problem as a society. So he established the theoretical foundations for what we should do to address the externality problem. And uh, his basic uh, solution is, is widely understood today as the Pigouvian tax. Essentially, he says, go out and figure out what the external costs are and then force those costs into the market. And he had this idea of taxing the polluters, saying you must account for these externalities in your production decisions and we will, that will correct the market failure. So technically what that would do is that would shift the supply curve to your left and you would see here that we would be at a new equilibrium, we'd be consuming less of the product and we'd be paying a higher price. So the solution to correcting market failures associated with externalities is to force the markets to internalize those external costs. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll have a quiz at the end. <laughs> so with that kind of understanding, in, 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 in externalities are pervasive throughout the energy markets. The prices that we pay for energy do not reflect the full costs uh, associated with that production, extraction, transportation, and refining of those energy resources. So the question, the core question that we're, we're discussing here this evening is this idea are, are the costs to Vermonters of continued use of fossil fuels greater than the alternatives? Okay. And maybe 10, 20 years ago, the question, the answer to that might have been, well, I'm not sure. But I think today, uh, there's getting more consensus around, yeah, we think there is. The costs of continued reliance on fossil fuels are greater than the alternatives. And that's uh, due a uh, large part because of uh, what we've seen in terms of the technology development, in terms of solar and wind and other energy resources, and the price of those resources have come down dramatically. In fact, now um, there's companies that can, are marketing solar to consumers at a price which is less than that what they pay their uh, conventional utility. So I think <coughs> the scale is tipping here. We as a society are beginning to recognize that uh, the cost of continued reliance on fossil fuels are greater than um, the alternatives. So obviously I'm not the only one who's come to this conclusion. Policymakers as well uh, have uh, come to this conclusion that we don't know exactly what the externalities are, but we know that there are these impacts, they're, they're harming society. And so there's a public good, a public policy goal of promoting greater reliance on renewable forms of energy. <clears throat> and the first point would be first try to uh, capture the efficiency opportunities um, because efficiency is the least cost resource out there. And so in 2000, Efficiency Vermont was formed. Prior to 2000, the utilities were uh, doing energy efficiency programs, but Vermont uh, decided to try a new model. They set up a specific entity that was responsible for working with Vermonters to help them reduce the amount of energy that they consume. And Efficiency Vermont has been very successful uh, over their 15-year history. So then back in 2005, uh, the state legis legislature excuse me, established the Vermont SPEED program, which stands for, I think, Sustainably Priced Energy Economic Development Program. So it, w it set these goals. It said, we believe that there's a public interest in promoting renewable energy in the state of Vermont, in particular, investing in in-state renewable energy projects. So they set out these goals, 20% by 2015, um, uh, the exact numbers uh, I don't have on, off the top of my head, 
but uh, it was pretty uh, pretty exciting in innovation. It was it was Vermont committing to supporting renewable energy development, and then that <coughs> policy was um, revised in 2009 um, by uh, Act 45, and this was modeled after what many of the European countries were doing to promote renewable energy development using what they call feed-in tariffs. So the standard offer is Vermont's version of that. We were the first state in the country to um, have a legislatively sanctioned standard offer or feed-in tariff. And what that entails is if you develop a renewable energy project in Vermont, wind or solar, you are guaranteed a specific above market rate for that energy over a certain time horizon, 20 or 25 years. So what that did is that gave assurance to investors that if we build this solar or these wind farms, that we're going to have um, a, a, a flow of cash through the sale of the energy at this feed-in tariff for the standard offer rate for 20, 25 years. And then you can go to the bank with that and, and get the financing for your project. So that was subsequently um, revised in 2012. Uh, there was some um, belief amongst certain policymakers that the, the rate that um, Vermont established, this above market rate, was, was um, more than really perhaps needed to be. So they moved to um, doing the standard offer, tying the payments to market-based prices. And then uh, most recently, in 2013, that was again revised. And um, now the uh, VEPI, which stands for Vermont Electric Power Pur Producers, it's, a, it's an entity that was set up in Vermont to uh, purchase renewable energy from these projects. Uh, now they went to what they call an RFP process, where they issue an RFP. We want two megawatts of solar. Companies then bid on those projects, and the lowest cost bidder is, is awarded the contract. So, um, so this has really been Vermont's approach to um, renewable energy development over the past 15 years, and it's been quite successful. It's been quite successful. We have uh, 53 megawatts as of 2013. I know that's much higher today. Um, we've done quite a bit of solar in 2014. Uh, 119 megawatts of wind have been installed in Vermont. So, so this has really been, um, you know, for a small state, that's pretty, it's pretty good. Uh, we've, we've seen quite a bit of renewable energy development in the state of Vermont. <clears throat> so the question is, this is what the legislature is working on this year, what's for 2015 and beyond? And right now there is uh, some legislation that's working its way through the various committees up in Montpelier, and uh, they're looking at what they call a Renewable Portfolio Standard, RPS, Renewable por Portfolio Standard. And a Renewable Portfolio Standard is a requirement that utilities operating within a state have to deliver, purchase a certain percentage of the energy that they deliver to their customers from renewable sources. So 20%, say by 2020. So for your utility working in the state, you have to demonstrate to regulators that you've met that goal, that 20% of the power you're delivering to your customers is coming from uh, renewable energy resources. So, so historically, the, um, the SPEED program and what Vermont has done in terms of developing renewable energy projects in Vermont, uh, there is no statutory requirement for utilities to retain the renewable energy certificates. So renewable energy certificates are uh, a feature of energy that's produced from renewable energy resources. And there's a whole system in the state of New England where they track generation resources. And they issue a renewable energy credit for every megawatt hour that you produce using solar or wind or other qualified renewable energy resource. So, um, so how the RPS will be different in Vermont um, as opposed to our current program will be that the utilities would be required under the RPS to, to keep the RECs for the energy that they produce in state that's, genera that's generated from renewable energy resources. Does that make sense? Correct. It's it's only in the it's in the committee phase at this point. And I'm actually not exactly sure where they are in the process, but I believe it's in the committee phase. Okay. And the, the public service department has put out some information on kind of what the structure might look like. Gotcha. I can I can give folks some information on that if they like. <clears throat> so um, so you know this this rec issue has has been a little controversial in Vermont. Um, as soon as you sell a rec then you kind of give up the right to say that you're producing renewable energy, that you're consuming renewable energy. Because that wreck is going to someone else um, in, 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 in pursuit of their um, mandate to 
sell into water to their customers. And I'll get into that a little bit in just a second. So in Vermont, we have been uh, selling our rents to uh, our neighbors across New England, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and elsewhere. And so with this RPS change, uh, that will, uh, if we move to an RPS, it's, it's not by any means a, a certainty. If we move to an RPS, then the state uh, utilities within the state of Vermont would be required to uh, maintain those renewable energy credits. And, and there will certainly be an economic uh, impact uh, uh, in the state if that is the case. So just to give you a sense, um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, of other states that are, are pursuing this RPS, if you look at this map, you can see that Vermont um, today is kind of an anomaly in the Northeast. All the surrounding states have renewable portfolio standards. So there's really this idea that if Vermont moves to this RPS approach, that will be in line with our neighbors. And some more specifics in terms of um, the other states, just if you're curious, New Hampshire has an RPS 24.8%. I don't know how they came up with that. Uh, by 2025. And Maine, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts all have uh, RPSs with various targets. So this, this REC idea is kind of a market-based approach to meeting these regulations. So rather than saying, utility, you must build wind or solar, they say, utility, you have to either build wind and solar, retain the RECs, or go out and buy RECs in the market. And there's a market, like the stock exchange, where you can go and buy and sell RECs, renewable energy credits. And so the Vermont utilities have been selling those RECs in those markets in Connecticut and elsewhere. And again, if we move towards an RPS system, that would likely change. And you know, I, I should, should mention that you know, the utilities um, are, aren't making, uh, they have been very uh, forthright in terms of saying you know, we, we are selling these racks, it's generating revenue for, uh, for the company, and it's allowing us to keep the rates uh, relatively low. And there has been no legislative <coughs> mandate for them to, to retain those racks. So it, it makes uh, sense uh, from a business perspective. <coughs> And uh, the investment that we've done in renewable, energy, in renewable energy in Vermont has really had a tremendous impact in terms of employment. Uh, we have a lot of companies in the state that are innovators in renewable energy project development and financing. Um, so it really has uh, had, had a broad economic benefit to the state. So most of what we've been doing as a state, oh my gosh, oh no, I, I, I was <coughs> so almost six, I have a whole half hour, okay. <laughs> So uh, what we've been doing as a state on the policy front has mostly been around electricity. Okay? So electricity is just a, is one part of our energy footprint. In fact, Vermont has, uh, has, has quite a, a, a low carbon energy supply mix for electricity. So there's now a, a, a good discussion which happening at various levels in the state moving towards kind of an all fuels approach to correcting market failures for um, fossil fuels. So we need to not only look at electricity, we need to look at uh, gasoline and diesel fuel used in our cars and trucks. We also need to look at the fuels we use for space heating in our homes and businesses. Okay? So if we want to address the market failure associated with energy, we need to broaden our scope beyond electricity to look at these other sectors, transportation and thermal. And um, the state of Vermont, um, in uh, 2011, put out a comprehensive energy plan, and in that plan, they took an all fuels approach. They said, you know, as a state, we need to broaden our scope. We've done a great job with electricity. Now we've got to start thinking creatively about how to address transportation and, and thermal heating in our buildings. And so uh, this proposal has a very bold uh, goal. It's, it's not it's not uh, a statutory mandate, but it's a goal to achieve 90% renewables by 2050 across all these sectors, transportation, thermal, and electrical. So that is, is, is quite uh, uh, an undertaking to, to go through. So uh, quite an uh, ambitious goal, so I think I'm back. So um, what I want to do now is I just want to talk about, uh, there's an organization in Vermont called the Energy Action Network. I don't know if folks have, have um, heard of that group. Uh, uh, Lee Sennon, um, who's someone I've known for, for many years, um, is on the board of uh, Energy Action Network. And they produced a, 
kind of somewhat of a, of a roadmap. What would it take for Vermont to meet this goal of 90% renewables by 2050? And so what I've done here is I've just taken from his report, they've kind of analyzed the different pathways. How could we get to, from where we are to where we want to be by 2050 in all these different sectors, electricity, transportation, and thermal. And so they rated the different technologies and approaches based on impact, high impact, getting us to the goal, medium impact, or low impact. So you certainly you can download the report from the website, but what I've done for you here is just outline the high and medium impact pathways to get us to that high renewable goal that we've established for ourselves. So the transportation sector, um, they rate plug-in electric vehicles as high potential, high impact. So if we can begin to transition our vehicle fleet away from gasoline towards electricity, that that's going to have a huge impact in terms of meeting our goals. Because our renewable, our electric sector is already on a, on a very steep trajectory towards high penetration of renewables. So if we can move from gasoline at the pump to electricity from the grid, that's going to be a high impact uh, for transportation. Uh, CAFE standards, CAFE stands for Corporate Average Fuel Economy. Those are national standards. Um, that would have a medium impact. We just require vehicles to be more fuel efficient. Uh, light and heavy vehicle biofuels using biodiesel or um, next generation cellulosic ethanol, uh, that uh, is considered in this report as having a medium impact in terms of meeting, meeting our goals. <clears throat> so on the thermal sector, uh, the pathways uh, that are invest that are uh, analyzed in this study, uh, building energy efficiency is high impact. There is a tremendous potential in this state to make our built environment more energy tight, more energy efficient. I know Ken Welch is part of uh, in, in working with GMP and others to um, really uh, move us in, in that direction. And so there's huge potential to make our, our buildings much more energy efficient. Uh, they rate heat pumps, uh, cold climate heat pumps, which is a new technology that's very promising in the state of Vermont. Uh, displace uh, fuel oil or propane for heating with electricity, medium impact, biomass in buildings using cord wood, uh, wood pellets, I use a wood pellet stove in my home. Uh, district heat using biomass, um, if you have large industrial uh, operations clustered together, it might be economic to come together and design a district heating system, which is a centralized boiler that distributes heat to multiple buildings. And then of course, uh, liquid biomass for heating, you can use uh, biodiesel, uh, to supplement uh, oil heating in a, in a standard furnace. There's a little bit of retrofitting that's required. The biodiesel can serve that role as well. And that's considered medium impact. <coughs> so then in the electrical sector, um, the uh, pathways here are listed. Uh, solar PV is viewed as a high impact, and we're seeing tremendous growth in the solar deployment uh, in the state of Vermont, uh, led by Green Mountain Power. Uh, Green Mountain Power last year was um, awarded the uh, Solar Utility of the Year by the Solar Electric Power Association, given what they're doing in Rutland and across the state. It's very exciting. Uh, HQ, Hydro Quebec, uh, hydro imports was uh, indicated as a, as a high impact. So if we were to import more hydro electrical energy from Hydro Quebec, that that would help us meet our, our ambitious goal of 90% renewables by 2050. Uh, electrical efficiency is a medium goal. We've done a lot over the past 15 years of electrical efficiency. There's more to do, uh, but that's considered medium impact. Uh, Vermont wind, considered medium impact. And then um, purchasing uh, renewable energy from regional markets uh, was also considered a medium impact. <coughs> so, <clears throat> I don't know, I call it the purple elephant. <coughs> but um, in the state of Vermont, there's a, a group, uh, Energy Independence Vermont, which is a coalition of groups that are coming together, and they're promoting a carbon pollution tax. And this is classic uh, uh, Arthur Pagu solution, right? Determine what the external costs are and put a tax on, on the product, and that should begin to correct the market failure. <coughs> so um, the group is very much in its, in its formative stage. They, they have a, a, a draft of a proposal, and they see a ramping of a carbon tax over uh, a number of years, 10 years, I believe. And so what you do is you would look, you would uh, uh, levy a, a, a dollar per ton charge for primary fuels that are used within the state of Vermont. And so the basic idea, again, the economic incentive 
is to, to, to charge, uh, charge for that carbon footprint, and that's going to direct us to choose energy sources that are lower carbon. Okay? So this carbon tax is um, lots of discussion. I don't anticipate this um, happening within the next year or two. <coughs> but there is a broad coalition of folks that have signed on to this, and, and this is a list of the organizations that have um, committed to the, uh, signed on to this idea, including Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, which uh, has the Vermont Efficiency Vermont contract, uh, many nonprofits, uh, Vermont businesses for social responsibility. And so there's broad uh, a coalition that's forming around this idea that we, we've got to address uh, this issue and a carbon tax uh, seems uh, to be uh, a viable approach to that. There are some examples which have shown this to be very effective. Uh, in British Columbia, they've uh, instituted a carbon tax. And I remember reading a news uh, report that um, uh, that province, uh, the per capita energy has gone down, and it doesn't uh, have seemed to really affect the, economic, uh, the economy of the province relative to other provinces in Canada. Um, but it's, it's complicated. Uh, there are lots of issues. Uh, some are concerned about the re regressive nature of a carbon tax, that it's going to affect low-income families disproportionately. And so there's mechanisms that you can use to uh, address those concerns. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to, this is just kind of a random, hopefully it's not too random, <laughs> instead of just kind of concluding thoughts, I'm going to show another little video clip and then I want to open it up for discussion. Um, the challenge is that our climate is difficult in our topography. We're, we're hilly and it's cold and we've been feeling the cold here for the past month. Eight, minus 18 degrees at my home uh, this morning. It was, it was cold. Um, so that's a challenge, um, in, in particular for electric vehicles. Electric vehicles was viewed as a, as a high impact um, opportunity pathway to uh, high renewables. Um, and, and that's going to uh, create a challenge. Uh, the batteries, the range of the vehicles isn't quite um, um, where uh, Vermonters may want that to be. Uh, but we are seeing the uptake in renewable e in, in electric vehicles in Vermont. Uh, it's actually growing quite rapidly. And Vermont is small. You know, we're a small state, 600,000 people. Uh, you know, that's a couple square blocks in New York City. Uh, we're small. Uh, so it's, it's really both a kind of a, an opportunity and a challenge. In terms of a challenge, um, you know, we don't want to be on the bleeding edge of this. Um, you know, we want them to remain competitive. Um, we want to be in line with our New England neighbors. Um, so um, so that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, you know, we, we, we want to make sure that we're not um, disadvantaging, disadvantaging our businesses and uh, others in the state um, by moving too fast, too quickly. Um, but um, on, the, on the other hand, because we are small, we're nimble, we can do things that are innovative. And um, in that sense, uh, that's, a, that's a real opportunity. One thing that I think is important is we need to, we need to shift our focus from rates to bills. Okay? Uh, at the conference uh, in uh, October, Renewable Energy Vermont's annual conference, we had a speaker from the California Energy Commission. And he, <coughs> uh, California, he said, has the highest rates but the lowest electric bills. Uh, California has invested heavily in energy efficiency over the years. And so although they have high electric rates, <coughs> at the end of the month, the bill is smaller because they've done so much efficiency. And so, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that cold weather. <coughs> and so the other thing is as you begin to think across these sectors, if we, if we displace gasoline with electricity as a fuel for vehicles, it's a, it's a cheaper fuel. And so that's going to help us reduce our overall energy bills uh, over time. <coughs> Similarly, heat pumps, if you displace fuel oil or propane with a heat pump, electricity uh, with these efficient devices at 200, 250% efficiency, um, will, uh, will uh, electricity will be a lower cost fuel source than oil or propane in many cases. <coughs> uh, Vermonters overwhelmingly support renewable energy. Uh, I think surveys suggest 90% of Vermonters would like to see more renewable energy uh, in the state of Vermont, which is an opportunity. The challenge is we're seeing rising um, groups uh, organizing around uh, raising concerns about project siting. Uh, we've, we've had that for a number of years uh, with wind siting on, on our ridge lines, and we're beginning to see that now with some of the large solar projects that are going, going uh, in the state. There's, there's getting to be some, some uh, local organizers or, uh, uh, with concern about the siting of those. <coughs> 
Um, what I think is a tremendous opportunity is that Vermont uh, has invested in infrastructure, fiber optic and smart grid technology. And so there's huge potential to leverage uh, the fiber optic information uh, highway with smart grid technology to transition to these renewable forms of uh, energy, um, which have some challenges. Solar and wind, of course, are intermittent. They're not always available when you need them. So smart grids and information overlaid with the physical distribution of power uh, can really uh, be a huge benefit. And so that's something to, to, to consider. <clears throat> and this finally, Green Mountain uh, Power, um, the state's largest investor, Yellen Utility, um, is, is, is innovative. Look where we are in this Energy Innovation Center. There's all sorts of uh, exciting technology, which is on display here. And uh, they've really committed to uh, renewable energy and to the city of Rutland, which is exciting. And very recently, I understand, uh, Green Mountain Power uh, achieved B Corporation status. How many people know what that is? <coughs> okay, you guys do. <coughs> uh, B Corp stands for Benefit Corporation. And so it's, um, it's a rigorous process where you have to go through this screening process and a third party verifier called B Lab looks at all your data and your operations and they say, yeah, this, this company really deserves to be B certified. It means that the company, um, uh, although you know, it has a fiduciary responsibility to its investors, it also uh, has acknowledged that it has a responsibility to a society more, more broad, a benefits corporation. Uh, so that's very exciting. It's, I think, the first utility in the country to, in the to, world, in the world <coughs> to uh, achieve B, uh, B, B corporation certification. So, uh, so that's exciting. So, um, so again, so there's challenges, but there's lots of opportunities. And, and hopefully, in the discussion period, we can hear uh, some of the ideas that you you guys might have. So now let's uh, one more little video clip. <coughs> I'm getting fancy on you guys. course it's not going to work. <laughs> oh, that's not. <laughs> well, now it's going to work. Using major physical features of the planet. It's an economic crisis, it's a civilization crisis, and ultimately it's a crisis of our species. This is a global problem. We absolutely need a global solution. There is a big cultural shift that's happening. You know, there's a movement for democracy, justice, and sustainability that is sweeping across the nation and actually across the planet. We believe that it's technically and economically feasible to repower the entire world's energy infrastructure for all purposes with renewable energy. That's where we're headed, to this new paradigm of abundance, where we can take this resource that produces more energy in a day than all the energy we can extract from all known sources underground ever. We understand the science, we understand the choices, and we're going to fund and support the businesses that actually bring us the kind of energy that we know will work for our future generations. So when we get together, cross-generational, and pull this together, it's just totally rewarding. This is a movement of people, that this is a movement about justice, that this is a, a global movement that's really about how do we put the planet and the people first. This is the largest social movement in human history. 
climate change and the energy crisis puts it into perspective and how this moment is our opportunity to, to like take that next evolutionary thrust. The question is not if we are going to go to 100% renewable energy, it is how and when. That um, is the trailer for a documentary that came out in uh, September called The Future of Energy. I uh, showed it in my class the other day. The students, I think, uh, enjoyed it. I would recommend it. <clears throat> so um, I think with that, I just want to um, conclude. Uh, and again, just to this go up. Did I do that? There's just one more cartoon I wanted to show you. <laughs> <coughs> oh, it's It's this professor on the board. He said, climate, no, here it is. No, no. climate change threatens your existence. Nobody's, nobody's watching, listening, and say, climate change threatens our economy. Everyone wakes up. <laughs> climate change is affecting our economy. It's time to wake up. Thank you very much. <laughs>
biodiesel in your furnace as it is today, you have to change out some gaskets and stuff because it's a corrosive. Um, so there's some alterations you have to do. I mean, it's not impossible, and it wouldn't be hugely expensive, but you'd have to make some some um, adjustments. Do you know if you're able to make your own fuel? Maybe you look for um, Yeah, I, I, you can. There are folks that in the garages can can make biodiesel, which is taking waste vegetable oil and through a chemical conversion process uh, create the biodiesel. Um, it's it's a little dangerous. You want to be careful. But there are companies now that are, are collecting waste vegetable oil from large regions and, and doing it centrally, and you can just buy it. Okay. So what are you including in biofuels? Biofuels is a, is a, is a broad, um, bioenergy is a very broad concept, so you need to think of it by sector. So for like space heating, you know, you could use um, woody bio, you know, woody biomass, cordwood, wood pellets, or you could use liquid biofuel in a conventional furnace. Um, and uh, for transportation, you know, biofuels are liquid biofuels, um, biodiesel or uh, ethanol. Okay, so you're including ethanol. Yes, um, I didn't have, didn't get into that, but uh, most of the ethanol, you know, all the gas that we buy is a blend of ethanol, right. and that's that was produced using corn. Now, and there's uh, there's concern about the um, efficiency of that. But isn't that, there's a big conservation environmental problem? Well, I think the strongest argument uh, uh, against uh, corn-based ethanol is the energy return on energy invested. You put a gallon of gasoline in to grow the corn, process it into, bio, into ethanol, and you get maybe a little more than a gallon out. So it's, it's, it's it, and there's lots of research into the next generation biofuels, um, and that's using, um, you know, general woody, uh, bio, um, general biomass leaves and branches. In, in producing a fuel with that, but they haven't really cracked the code in that yet. There's no commercial, large-scale um, um, operations making that ethanol from, from those sources. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in, this, in the state of Vermont, um, you know, the, the using wood chips just to generate electricity that that's been controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can do it a combined heat and power using the waste heat and generating electricity, that increases the efficiency of the system. Um, we do have two large biomass plants, Rygate and McNeil plant in the state of Vermont, um, which just burn wood chips. But, uh, like, it's unlikely that we'll see more of that. It just seems when you talk about biofuels, it's just like such a big... It's very broad. That it almost has to be broken up into different... I like to think of it by sector, for you know electricity... No, I'm talking about just the source of it. You know, like if you're talking about corn to make ethanol, which is a lot different than right. making wood pellets. Right. It's it just is. so broad. Very, it, 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 you know, absolutely. It's very broad. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How much, <coughs> how much of an educational effort is going on in Vermont? Uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I still run into lots of people who say things like, I hate renewable energy, you know, that kind of thing. So, is, is efficiency for mine, is that it, or what, what's being done so people understand and know? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of an organization called Renewable Energy Vermont, which is an um, industry association of renewable energy companies. And we do some education, but we identified that there's a, a need for greater education on these issues, and we're actually <coughs> in the process of forming a, a 501c3 that would uh, be a charitable organization that would focus on um, outreach and education on these issues. Green Mountain Power's been doing a great job. I mean, this, this Energy Innovation Center is, is all about educating the public about, um, about these opportunities. Um, but the, the surveys uh, suggest that Vermonters, by and large, the few folks you run into are minority. 90% of Vermonters support renewable energy when asked in surveys. Yeah, I, think, I think that's a really important point, too. Points I'll just make. Um, I'm Steve Costello from GMP, who for anyone who doesn't know me. Um, I thought the video at the beginning was really prescient because it it shows what we deal with every day. Um, people don't want to see where their energy comes from. They don't want to know. They don't want to care. Um, a, a small minority, and they're they're the same people who are very vocal when you start um, trying to do it locally, and they see it, and they don't want to look at a solar panel or a wind turbine or whatever. And the alternatives are obviously dramatically worse. Um, to, to your point, Steve, about Vermonters do support it. We actually do routine 
um, surveying of our customers. And one of the questions we ask, and you couldn't ask it in a much more negative way, is do you support, and we do that intentionally so we really make clear what we're asking. Um, we ask a question that essentially is, do you support the continued ridgeline development of new wind in Vermont at a utility scale? And still 75, 80, 85% of Vermonters say yes every single really? time. So it is a very vocal, small minority yeah. that, that you're hearing from. Yeah. So Steve, just to, to address your, um, through the eHome, I work for NeighborWorks, but I also work with Green Mountain Power in this eHome program. And we, basically, one home at a time, we present a three-legged stool to them, where we're talking about tightening up the house, <coughs> shell improvements, um, looking at alternative heating systems such as heat pumps that heat this building and the icing on the cake is renewables so people are hearing that message those three components are what make energy independence so the words getting out slowly and you know a lot of people are on board with with renewables but we're reinforcing it every day but when we talk to folks that's all part of our mantra People want to learn more about that. We do have an open house on Saturday from nine to one here with tours of the Borkowski House over on uh, Baxter Street. So you can really see we took a 95-year-old house, and it's probably the most efficient and energy independent home in Rutland County right now. Um, and no fossil fuels left at all. They don't even have oil anymore. Um, really neat project, and we're interested in working with. You know, we want to do 100 homes in Rutland County. Um, in the next few months, so if anyone's interested in that, I um, encourage you to come on Saturday or just contact anyone at GMP and we can give you more information. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, I didn't make this point in the presentation, but it, it really, it's not, a, it's, I don't, it's, it's not primarily a techno technological issue at this stage. Uh, the technology is, is there. Can it be improved? Will it be improved? Absolutely. But it's, it's really a political and a social challenge and, and so what you guys are keying on is so important in terms of how we think about energy I mean most people you know they just want to flip the switch and have the light come on and, and that's it and go to the gas pump and fill up and go on their way um, but uh, but but it's changing it is changing and there is a there is a broad coalition in Vermont and across the country that's really advocating for this this rapid change you know I mean we're kind of small potatoes in Vermont and, and, but everybody has to do their part I can't argue with that, but when you showed the video at the beginning and you showed the, the Deepwater Horizon platform and all that strip mining and all that, and all those enormous corporations that are running, that own those places, are, and their shareholders, I, are they thinking about this? Or are they thinking, well, maybe we need to do a little of this and a little of that and get away from stuff? We I mean, need to change all that. Well, you know, it's that's, so uh, yeah, it, it is huge, and it really, that's why the market failure is, is the primary rationale for government intervention in the marketplace. And, and one of the, historically, um, market failure, one of the key issues of uh, factor leading to market failure is monopoly control. And so if there's a monopoly, a single, per, you know, single company, then in, in the free market, then they're going to, it's not going to be the best outcome for society. So we, we instituted the Sherman Antitrust Act and broke up all these companies. You know, utility companies aside, they're regulated. You know, they have a, a strong oversight. So if you're if you're a natural monopoly, you're gonna you're subject automatically to government supervision. But these companies, they're they're not required, in in their pursuing you know their mandate to maximize shareholder value. But do you see any of these corporations going out there looking at? Well, maybe we need to be looking into solar. <clears throat> we need to be putting our scientists to work coming up with some. Absolutely. Oh, that's what they are doing. Yeah, I mean, B, you know, BP started the whole BP Solar. Um, you know, there's uh, all these. Exxon, I'm sure, has investments in. I mean, these are mass. You know, energy. These are the biggest companies yeah, in the, no, the world. Yeah, no, huge companies. Yeah. So they, they are they are dabbling into this, but but their their core bread and butter is is extraction, so refining, and sale of fossil fuels. Right. And so um, you so know, how do you push that out? How do you it's uh, it's public policy requires policy. Steve, Steve made the point really well at the beginning when he talked about the, the economy and or economics and how it works. I mean, the price of solar has dropped like a rock in the last three or four years. Um, Is know, that enough, though? To it, it's 
it's going to force utilities to start changing very quickly. I mean, five years ago, utilities thought, ah, the traditional model is going to last forever. And it's not. Right. And it's one of the reasons that we're doing things like e-homes and trying to develop a new business model. And other utilities are a little slow to catch on to it, but they're going to have to adapt. Yeah, but what about the big right. oil corporations? I think the same areas. thing. They're going to see a value in, in solar. They're going to be able to you know, develop and make money in, in those industries. And if you can, you know, cars are, it's taken a little while, but mm -hmm. if you can operate a car for half the price of an oil car, the, the manufacturers are going to be and they are slowly and getting really around matters. to that too. Um, it's not easy because people are so stuck in their ways. The utility oh, world, in particular, the electric world. Yeah. Um, you know, we're we're like a pariah almost <laughs> in the, in the utility world. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a conservative and it's about reliability. I mean, their, their their key mandate is to provide reliable because electricity has become such a vital part of our economy. It's safety. It's well-being, and so um, so that's their main focus. But folks like Green Mountain Power are thinking beyond the reliability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is becoming uh, an increasingly important part of their mandate. Would it make sense sense to uh, uh, look at kids in elementary school and start teaching more about conservation and and these kind of issues? And they can go home and tell their parents and yeah. force a change, you know, if you can get them going. We do, we do hundreds yeah. of kids a year come through here from schools all over the state. Yeah. And there are other organizations doing the same thing. There's a, uh, what's the Vermont? Okay, I was going to say VEEP. VEEP, Vermont Energy. Energy Education Project. Project, yeah. Which actually Staff Protect was um, working with them on a project to um, pilot um, that we worked with uh, too for their smart meter and they so about the technology renewables they will start talking about, about how power so they do they come into the classroom they train teachers yeah. so it's out there and it's you know learning more and adding more renewables and more options yeah um, and, 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 uh, and you know I'm a professor at Green Mountain College and in higher education sustainability is becoming mm -hmm. you know a major uh, part of curriculum Green Mountain College has been doing it for 20 years. They're doing a great job. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. And bring, bring student help about Energy Innovation Center. And the, and the well, we are at 6.30. I, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes. Thank you for coming out. Hopefully you got something out of this evening's uh, presentation. Um, so the, 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 the documentary I showed at the end is called Future Energy. Um, it's, I think it's worth uh, the time. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, it features... Um, Scott Johnstone, who is the, the CEO of uh, Director of uh, Efficiency Vermont or Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, so this is a Vermont piece to it. Uh, Bill McKibben, of course, uh, was on there at Middlebury College. Um, so, uh, so show it in your communities. Thank you very much. Thank you.